most defining moments in our lives come with little fanfare and little warning. Change usually happens through choice, through chance, or through crisis. And sometimes we get sent life tremors. They're warning signs. And sometimes we get sent life quakes. And they have the ability to either bury us or to break us open and plant us like a seed. This is not my standard presentation. This is not a professional presentation that I would give to a corporate. In fact, you're getting just me and just you. We know each other, and I'm just here to share where I'm at, to share my story, and to share what I've learned so far. I even have crib notes, I have to say, because this is a fairly emotional speech. So on the 18th of November, 2017, we were dealt such a life quake. It was brutal. It was sudden. It took my breath away, and everything stopped. And time was divided into two parts. Before this, and after this, and nothing would ever be the same again. Six minutes that changed our lives forever. As I said, nothing comes with fanfare that's about to redefine your life. At three o'clock in the morning, I woke up. Our dog was barking very vociferously at the bottom of the garden. And Simon wasn't in the bed next to me. That was a fairly regular occurrence because he didn't sleep that well. In the wee hours of the morning, he'd get up and go and watch a TV program and then come back to bed. So I padded up the, the passageway and I just nonchalantly kind of said, gee, Roxy's really barking. And then I carried on into the kitchen, made myself something to drink, walked back down to the bedroom, put it um, next to my bed, put my glasses on because I needed to read a couple of pages. Yes, Joni, I was reading novels then. <laughs> and picked up my book, put it on the bed, and was about to swing my legs into the bed, and I heard a commotion. I had heard him call the dog, but I had no idea whether he'd popped his head out the window, which was our agreement. If anything happens on the property at night, you don't go outside. We do live in a, in, in a violent country and an unpredictable country. So I'd heard him call for the dog, and then there was a commotion. That's the only word that I can actually use to describe what I heard. I never heard a shot. I didn't hear any words. Maybe my brain has blocked those things out. I'm not sure. At that point, I started running a scenario. A scenario that I taught my kids a very, very long time ago. When they were very little, I taught them that if I come to you at night and I tell you to run, you take yourselves to the bathroom, you lock yourselves in, and you do not come out until one of us tells you you can. So I went on to automatic pilot, and it's what saved my life. So I ran down, I ran up the passage, tried to lock Matthew and I into the bedroom section. My eldest son was out at the time. And there was no key in the door. There was a key in the security gate, but I didn't want to open the wooden door to see what was going on on the other side. And then I had to make a decision no mother should have to make. I had to leave my child behind. And I ran into our bedroom, tried to lock the door. There was no key in the door. I ran past my bedside table, picked up my cell phone, ran into the bathroom, and there were three keys in the door. At which point, I made six calls on speed dial. Thank God I had my glasses on. And then I heard three very quiet knocks at the door. And with each knock, there was a very quiet open the door. 
On the third knock, I said, who's there? At which point they'd brought my son down at gunpoint and Matthew said, they've got a gun. And then he heard something he's never heard before. His mother swore like she's never sworn before. And I quite literally yelled at them numerous times to fuck off in no uncertain terms. And he, he will tell you, if he was here today, he would say to you, did she tell you that she didn't open the fucking door? And you know what? If I had, he couldn't have been so calm. Because he, after they had tried to kick down the door three times, taking a three-meter flying leap, because we had solid Maranti doors, he actually said to them, you might as well give it up. She's called for help, because after I told them to disappear, I was screaming out my window for my neighbor who I knew was awake. And he told them, you might as well give it up called for help, and you know what they did? They turned around and they ran. Picked up smalls as they went along, but they didn't touch him. Not a hair on his head. He wasn't pistol whipped. He wasn't tied up. He wasn't beaten. He wasn't punched. He wasn't kicked. And I think it was because he was so unbelievably calm. Second thing, he had no one to defend because I didn't open the door. If I had opened that door, he would have had everything to lose. And I had made a decision very many years ago, and it was part of what was running through my psyche, brain, instinct. And this is a very weird thing to say, but if I had opened that door, the chances of being raped were so high and being raped in front of my son. And I don't know how you live with that. I don't know how he would have recovered from that. From beginning to end, why do we know it was six minutes? Because we could interrogate our alarm system. And we could see at what time they'd come in and what time they'd left. And it was exactly six minutes that changed our lives. Fast forward, it was actually an interesting thing. People said to me, how could you go back to work so early? And I didn't. And because I'm a speaker and an entrepreneur, I could take almost three months off. If you work for a corporate, you get three days. And I do not know how you can deal with that. That is inhumane. Right, so three months later, I stepped back into the public eye and I did my first media interview, which was, I have to say, a big ask. So last year in November, the family of our very much loved <coughs> creative parenting expert Nikki Bush suffered a tragic loss when they were attacked in their home in Johannesburg and Nikki's husband Simon was shot and killed. Those were a few moments, in fact just six minutes, that changed the family's lives forever. And this morning Nikki rejoins us here on the couch to share some of her experience of living a life after this tragic event. Nikki. My God, we've missed you. We love you so much. It is so good to have you back in our field, our energy here. Yeah, our condolences to you and the boys and your family. I know words don't even begin to, to express. I, I, I suppose the question ringing through my mind is, is how are you? Is there even a way that you can answer that, that question where you are right now? Sure, Graham, it's a very loaded question. Um, it depends what moment you ask me. And it's very difficult to put any of this to words. In fact, just for the last two and a half months, I've just been saying to people, this is just the most bizarre experience and there are no words to describe what we're going through. The, the picture we had is broken and nobody can fix that picture. We can only focus on healing ourselves over time. <coughs> It's, it's like stepping into a different reality. Uh, and I'm so glad we had an opportunity to connect again yesterday so I, I could just feel your presence. I didn't realize how much I would miss you with having the um, little jack around and how much I've relied on you as my, my parenting brain every week to, to plug into. And I think what, is, what has really inspired me is, is during this time, life goes on. Your boys have got to go through these major milestones. There's been varsity, there's been finishing of matric, 
Um, driver's licenses. Driver's licenses. Yeah. All the things that dad's supposed to be here for, you know. <sighs> and, and that's tough. That's really tough, you know. And I think uh, when you take the three of us, we are going through three different versions of the same trauma. And I think that that's quite hard to handle because we were in three different places when it happens. So, you know, our view of it, our experience of it, is incredibly diff difficult and different. Um, and bearing that in mind, you know, that my trauma is different to both my son's trauma, it's quite complicated. Uh, quite complicated, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. Um, I, I am amazed at how you've chosen to become a voice for so many people that, that don't have that voice going through this very same experience and you've been able to apply so much of the knowledge that you get to impart every day. How important is finding that routine? What has been your saving grace to, to pull through those, those seconds when it gets to its very worst? So I guess we're not going through normal anymore. Our normal is different and we're trying to create a new normal. And I talk a lot to people about routine, that families need routine. And for two and a half months, we've had no routine. Um, I don't think I've cooked more than five meals in two and a half months. I go to bed at strange hours. We get up at strange hours. Um, and we, we're actually ready to get back into some kind of normal, which for us would be routine of going back to work. And I have to say, as hard as it's been to step back into the world of work, it's also quite nice to feel just a little bit normal every now and again. And uh, obviously my son has started varsity and my eldest son started a new job. So, yeah, we are finding a sense of, of normality, but certainly nowhere near a sense of peace yet. Um, and, and maybe that has to be redefined, um, you know, that we might never find our way back to that place. But um, the fact that you have all shown each other so much strength is amazing to me. For someone who's going through this, this same scenario, what do you need in a time like this? What has stood out for you? Um, I guess almost equal amounts of space to process, but lots of people to carry you because you just you cannot do this alone. Um, there are just so many things that have to be done at speed under huge pressure. I have huge gaps in my memory um, and you need people you really trust um, around you. So to everybody who has sent through messages of love and support, to all the people who sent us meals, to people who just pitched in our space, especially to, to all our family and our friends who have just really carried us. I mean, you just don't realize how kind the world is until you actually go through something like this. So despite the fact that it's been devastating, the opposite has been just the overwhelming kindness that we've experienced from everybody. So to everybody out there, thank you. Nikki, I think the, the way that you have approached this and the fact that you have chosen, you have chosen to show so much bravery and you are being heroic and being that voice for so many people that don't have that voice in this country, so many women, so many families. That is a choice. As much as Simon was taken away from you and that wasn't a choice, you have chosen to live true to his legacy. Um, and he chose to be a hero for you and your boys. And that is something truly remarkable and something that, that I, I will not be able to wrap my head around as a father and as a, as a partner. That is something that is absolutely amazing. We, we absolutely love you. We absolutely love you. Thank you so much for coming home. Thank you. We're going to take a, a very quick break. Yes. So I played that whole clip because it's pertinent to what I'm going to unpack for you now, because I really want to talk to you about what it feels like as a speaker to have your skittles knocked out from under you. As I said last night in my acceptance speech, this is not a job. This is a lifestyle. Being a speaker is about you. And when you get knocked out, what do you have left? How do you continue running a business? Uh, how do you continue making money when you're, you feel like you are living in almost two different paradigms, when one of you is in such severe shock and stress that some days you don't even know what your name is, and yet you have to get up and perform and carry on. And when I got on the aeroplane after that interview because Expresso is in Cape Town, I've had a, a, I've had a slot on Expresso for seven years, uh, I got on the plane and I just went... That interview should never have been necessary. 
that was just what I thought the whole way home. But this is my life. Um, and I want to talk to you about three things. My brain, my brand, and my business. So there was a moment, and I still feel it sometimes, like I've completely lost my mind. I have never had ADD in my life. I had instant ADD of severe magnitude. Didn't have the concentration span of a flea. My RAM, my processing power in my brain, was down at about 20% somewhere. Um, just so slow. Now, you guys know, I walk, I walk fast, I talk fast, I'm an action girl, um, I'm a visionary, I know where I'm going, I know what the plans are, I get the job done, and suddenly I'm, I'm crippled. I can't do any of those things because there is absolutely no energy. Your body, I think, keeps all its energy in the core to survive. My handwriting, I could barely write. I would trip and fall because I think you don't have energy in your feet, your hands, because everything is being pulled in. And it took a good sort of four months for that to start coming back. It took me going to America to speak for my RAM to come back up to about 70%. And that was great until we hit June, and then it went back down to about 40%. So just as I thought, I was getting it together. OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. I am not that person. But suddenly, this handbag that had been stolen was such an issue. But more, more than anything was the inner that lives inside my handbag, the organizer. I couldn't function without the organizer. I was so unbelievably grateful when about six, six weeks later, a friend delivered her organizer from the inside of her handbag, and suddenly I felt like I could survive my day. We were away with my entire family over Christmas. It was hardly a holiday. I didn't know what day of the week it was. I didn't care what anyone was eating. Ordinarily, I would have been that person. But there was one thing that concerned me most. Every time somebody went to the shops, I told them to check if we had fucking toilet paper. That's all I was interested in. Did we have toilet paper? Don't ask. <laughs> but when you have 14 people in a house, you've got to have toilet paper. <laughs> Panic attacks, well, that uh, stands, you know, stands to reason. Choices and decision-making just took too much energy. But here I am wrapping up the paperwork of a life because ultimately a life is paper, money, and memories. And I have no energy to do this. And yet, my signature is required for everything. I remember signing a rental contract after we sold our house and uh, we moved into rental accommodation. And it was a 13-page contract that came through. And I just phoned the estate agent and I said, I'm not signing this until you come and tell me what this means in English because I can't read. Because my faculties were zero. Sleeplessness, well, I laughed when Joni was, well, I actually cried, didn't I, Joni? I laughed when Joni was speaking because everything she said I know about sleep and everything has gone right out the window. And, uh, yeah, sleeplessness is a huge thing. Um, I landed up eating biscuits and drinking tea at 1 o'clock in the morning, which is probably why I've put on 11 kilograms since my husband died. Um, and wild thinking. So, Casper, wild thinking. I was, number one, going to pack up my family and get on a yacht, never having sailed anywhere before. Thought maybe an adventure would be a good idea. The second thing I thought, because my coach and counselor said, Nikki, you're going to need some new goals. So I thought, well, swimming seems to be my moving meditation. Um, why don't I become a springbok swimmer? <laughs> to which my mother said, when last did you swim in a gala? Well, that was when I was about 15. <laughs> So I said, don't worry, Mum. You know, Ian Reader, you know Ian Reader from the PSA? He'll take me through my paces. <laughs> I seriously thought I had a chance at one point. So, <laughs> so this wild thinking is a very, very real thing. Um, <laughs> and then my brand. So I discovered something really weird. You know, we've heard Helen Nicholson says, never believe your own PR. And I'm passionate about my work. I put my head down and I do what I do, A, because I love it, B, because it's, it makes a difference and it's relevant and people keep asking for more. 
And while I know I do a lot of media work and I've got a big digital footprint, I'm not there counting all the little likes and all the little, um, you know, the metrics. For me, I've, I've not believed in my own PR until 48 hours after Simon's death. And my dearest niece, Julia, 15 years old, sat me down. And she said, Nix, I hope you realize how much you are loved. And that was a very real statement, because I think we get so busy that sometimes we don't let all that love and support in. But when you are so vulnerable, suddenly it's allowed. And she followed that with something that completely knocked me off my feet. She said, and if you haven't yet realized it, I hope you know that you're famous. And through this process of losing my husband, I have discovered I am quite famous. <laughs> and it's been both amazing and devastating at the same time. To, to walk into a bank and to have people I have never met in my life walk up to me, look me in the eye, say, Nikki Bush, wrap their arms around me and move on. It just defies a lot of stuff, but it also shows how we as speakers sow into people's lives. And we often don't realize how much and how deeply we are impacting on people's lives. So that was the one lesson. Being very, very exposed and vulnerable, obviously. Having a complete crisis of confidence to get up in front of an audience again. I mean, you know, probably, when you get back to work in January and you haven't spoken for four or six weeks, you actually have a, a few butterflies in January. But now I'd been off for three months, and a lot of my work contained stories about Simon and my family, and I had no idea how I was going to react. My brand strength was tested. So how would my brand survive three months of doing nothing? How would it survive six months of almost doing nothing? And I have to say, it has survived. Um, so what are you doing to build your brand so that it has a reputation that goes beyond you being in front of an audience? i just come off a speaking roadshow for Investec, a six-stop roadshow. And the executive chef at Investec stood at our door on about the third or fourth day after Simon died with trays of food, all wheat-free. And she just stood there crying. It just impacted on people who'd never even met Simon. Uh, my brain was seriously challenged. When I say it was scary to stand up in front of an audience, and it still is for me when it's new material like this. Old material that is hardwired into my core, no problem. But anything new, I was battling to find my words. I would be in mid-sentence and not know what the next word was. Or I'd be in a conversation with somebody, and that night I'd go, what a fantastic conversation, but who the hell did I have it with? I had no clue. And I, I have to really thank my tribe um, you know, for, for being part of my life over this time. The PSA has been unbelievable. People who came to Simon's funeral, people who brought meals, um, came and visited, sat with me, all intrudes. And I forgot to say thank you last night. I have to take this opportunity to say that in my shock last night, I did not thank you, Paul, for everything that you have done for me over the years. I got my CSP because Paul believed in me. I raised my fees because Paul kept kicking me up the bat. Thank you, my darling. Um, I've had to call on people to do stuff for me. Steph, just recently, 45 minutes before a talk, Six minutes that changed my life talk that was seriously stressful, emotional, and the sound wasn't working. And I called him literally 45 minutes before I went on stage, and he arrived with every piece of equipment he had. And he stayed to listen. Thank you, Steph. <laughs> I'm just going to pick out a couple of people here because I want you to know that being part of an organization like this is a privilege. And we, we really do have such a bizarre kind of 
industry. We're a bunch of eclectic artists, really. All very different, all doing everything so differently and yet competing for the same business at the same time, and we share best practice. I mean, go figure. Graham, my cheerleader, I was going to America, couldn't think straight. I said, I'm not going to get there unless I have a cheerleader. He walked me through the visa process like word by word by word, uh, told me what hair dryers not to take, and because I, I quite literally was not functioning. Doug, how many times we've spoken and I've said, I've got this new material and I haven't a clue what to do with it. Um, and you're just a fantastic coach, you really are. Joni, you've walked your own journey with grief and just knowing that you're there in the background. I phoned her the other day because I was speaking for YPO at the Global Leadership Conference in Cape Town. It was a big thing for me. And about an hour before, I had a complete crisis of confidence. Of course, I knew what I needed to do, but I didn't believe I knew what I needed to do. And she was just there on the end of the phone and just did it for me. Uh, so many people. Sharon, everybody, thank you, thank you, thank you. I couldn't be standing here today without all of you who've been prepared to have those conversations with me, the hard conversations, the soft conversations, the visits. Um, it's just been, I don't know, I've just been absolutely enveloped in love. Some of the challenges I want to share with you. How do you get over a Google page that is filled with this? When your first 10 entries in Google, apart from your own website at the top, are suddenly all about murder. How do you get over that? This week is the first week I have two entries that have topped that. It has taken 17 months so far. So everything I've been teaching was put to the test. Suddenly, I was the student of my own teaching. And I had to really sit up and think and see if my stuff was valid. How often do we get that opportunity? So I teach, life does not unfold in a straight line. <laughs> so I just want to go to that one. <laughs> and while I'm on this one, I need to tell you, I have learned to swear, as you have heard. I have learned to lie. Even Steph knows I've learned to lie. I have learned to cheat. Because this is in the name of survival. When all your stuff stops, Vodacom, MTN, DSTV, extended warranties, life insurance policies, or everything, it just stops. When your, when your gate breaks, when your swimming pool pump breaks, and when your borehole pump explodes all in the same week, and you have no connectivity because you move to a place that has no internet and no cell phone sig signal, and you're trying to run a business, that's what my life looked like for quite some months. And I did learn to drink whiskey, thank you, Dave. <laughs> With soda. <laughs> and uh, I don't drink a lot, so don't think I've become an alcoholic. The other day, I actually had a Johnny Walker um, bottle on the stage, and my fairy godmother, who was an alcoholic, said, Nix, I think that's really not a very good idea. People are going to think you're an alcoholic. Um, OK. I've, I've stopped short at committing fraud, although somebody else committed fraud on my behalf, just so that I could close my telecom account. <laughs> okay, I have taught parents for many years about scenario planning, giving your children plan B. What if, what if happens? You need to have a plan B. I ran plan B, and plan B saved my life. Social media advice for kids and families, my book, Tech Savvy Parenting. If anyone needs the lowdown, there's a whole book on it outside. But I had to follow my advice. Do not go on social media when you're upset, when you're angry, etc. I had to do that. I had to engage a social media lawyer to check what I put out there. Um, and of course, she was telling me what I've been telling everybody. Make sure your entire family's social media profiles are on lockdown. Private, private, private. Bad news sells, I teach kids that all the time. 25,000 hits on Facebook when this news went up. I've never had so much coverage. Everybody needs a cheerleader or a Dumbo feather sometime. I think the one thing I've been really good at is articulating what I need and when, and calling on exactly the right people at the right time. 
and that we don't do life alone. We really don't, and that goes for all of you in this room as we stand. And I have to say, I look at this picture, and I look at that beautiful dress that I cannot fit anymore. <laughs> I had that dress made a month before Simon died, and I've never, never, ever worn it again. Right. Life is like an onion. Grief is like an onion. As you get to one layer, there's another layer, and another layer, and another layer. And when I gave my first six minutes talk to 150 women for Women's Day last year, still very, very raw, the vote of, and in the vote of thanks, um, the MD of Shas Everett said, uh, we are expecting a book from you on this, Nikki. So I said, so what's it going to be called? Six minutes that changed my life? Or more layers than a fucking onion? <laughs> and in, in unison, 150 women went, more layers than a fucking onion! <laughs> I don't know if Penguin is going to <laughs> approve of that, <laughs> but we might give it a try. <laughs> but seriously, just as you think you're through one layer and one level, there's another one, and I know this is a journey, and I'm only just beginning. Um, but you can't do this alone. Right, next lesson. Oh, yes, there we go. Probably the most important thing that has given me such a positive outlook to this journey and the reason why I can probably get up and do what I do is that on the day of Simon's funeral, at the end of the wake, I burst into tears at around 10 o'clock at night. It was a really difficult moment for me. It was probably the most difficult moment in the entire day. Because suddenly I realized that I didn't know what the next minute, what the next day looked like. Up until that point, in that week, I knew what was going to happen. But I'm a visionary. I always know what tomorrow looks like. I've got a plan. And I didn't know what Sunday was going to look like. And it scared the hell out of me. No idea. Fortunately, I had a friend standing next to me who's a psychologist. and She said to me, tell me what's going through your mind. And I said, this feels like a full stop. This feels like the end. And she said to me, you need to reframe this as a comma, as a pause, as a comma and dot, dot, dot. And the dots are the future that you are going to create for yourself. And that's been my guiding analogy. And those dots are made up of new people, new places, new adventures. And as a wise friend in this room has said to me, in some bizarre way, I have acquired a very rare form of freedom. I'm not divorced. There's no stigma. Everyone knows what's happened. My children are 19 and 23. I don't have to wipe their noses and bums. I can't actually do anything. But herein lies the challenge. So while this challenge didn't bury me, it has planted me like a seed. But a seed with so much freedom and so many possibilities and so many opportunities that it's almost scary. And I, I am moving forward with a huge sense of adventure and curiosity. But those challenges include things like, do I want this story to become my narrative? And these are serious questions that I do not have an answer to yet. And I'm posing them and sharing them with you because I would like some feedback from the experienced speakers in this room. I have a 20-year brand, particularly at 12, the last 12 years, have defined what I do and what I stand for and who I am as a creative parenting expert. So it's parenting, future-proofing, tech and kids, um, work-life balance issues, leadership and teamwork, because they all fall into, into family as well as the business environment. I have a brand. Do I ditch that and become the six minutes that changed my life speaker? 
which I could become because there is a demand for this. Do I want to do that? Should I do it? Would it be financially viable? So I sit in the seesaw situation. And I also know that right now I cannot stand up and do six minutes talks every day because I am gutted by the end of it. It hurts me too much at this point in time. So maybe at some point, or maybe it's just the way I package it. Because I think there are many different ways of packaging this, from really crappy customer service that I've received, and maybe I take that into corporates, those specific corporates that have actually given me really bad customer service, and I speak at all of their conferences. Maybe that becomes an added extra that I do. Maybe I do stuff for high-performing teams under stress around scenario planning because I've had this experience of disruption. Maybe that gets added to my bow. So I think it's more about how I integrate all of that, um, the way I do it, how much I, I do of it. But these are, these are really big questions. Where is home? What does home mean to me? What is freedom? What does freedom look like to me? And how do I live in a country where my husband was murdered? That is the question that was asked so often of me in Australia recently. And the only answer I have is that my family and my support structure are here. And how you would go through something like this or an illness or anything like that without a support structure, I don't know. While I'm talking of my support structure, I just really want to honor my mum and dad who have come through today. Mum and dad, maybe you can just stand up and everyone can see you. They've been my biggest supporters and fans my entire life. I really became a speaker when I was in my teens. I'd been quite a shy introvert. How often have you heard that speakers are introverts this weekend? I, I was this shy introvert, okay? And from about the age of 14, they told me that I'd wrecked their sex life. Because I used to sit on the end of their bed and solve the problems of the world every night between about 11 and 12 o'clock. <laughs> and uh, they're also my biggest critics. So if I, want, if I want honest feedback, I know where to go. So mum and dad, thank you. I love you. And I'm just so grateful you have been on this journey with me. So people are watching to see how I respond because I'm a public figure. They're watching. Where I take this work, they're watching. When I'm, I've done a couple of media interviews and the feedback is phenomenal. People want more of this. It's changing their lives. It's like Madeleine was saying yesterday with her 84-year-old um, granny who managed to you know, do the whole forgiveness thing before she died. I have people who get hold of me who say, thank you, thank you for stuffing me up. I hadn't cried for 17 years, and today I cried for the whole day, and I feel amazing. So there's a calling for this new content. But I want to put it back to you right now, that as speakers, we need to walk our talk. Because people take what we say very, very seriously. You know, you've, you've got to wear a mantle of responsibility when you're standing up here because you never know who is sitting in the room and who is going to be impacted by what you say. And I'm sure you often sit in a room where you listen to a speaker and you're kind of going, yeah, yeah, I'm not so sure. And then there's one thing. There's one thing they say that strikes a chord. As there will be one thing for you from this presentation. And our words do change behavior, and they do change lives. What we say does matter, and we matter. We, as speakers, we matter. We play a very huge role in society. And I want to tell you a story, and I know my time has just stopped. I want to tell you a story about a brand, about my husband. 
So I don't know if you can read the words at the bottom here. Gentleness, dignity, respect, and courage. Now, what was very, very interesting was that Simon was an engineer. He was not like me. Actually, he was very social. He was the extrovert. I'm the introvert. But his brand was so unbelievably consistent. You don't have to be on the stage, on radio, on TV to have a brand. Every single person in this room has a brand. Everyone here is a brand of one. And Simon was a very unique brand of one. So for that whole week, the months that followed, when people spoke to me about Simon, those things were consistent, so, so consistent about his brand. But my best moment was on the Thursday after he was killed. When all the domestic staff from our street, we had 13 homes in our street, came to visit at 8 o'clock one night with a bunch of flowers and a card. They'd seen everybody pouring in with flowers and food, and they'd gone to buy me a bunch of flowers. And they sat there and they said to me, Simon always talked to us. Simon always joked with us. Simon always made time for us. Simon always respected us. He was our father. Now that epitomized the man. And we have to make sure we're not just pitching at the CEOs in our audience, that we're pitching to everybody. Because we have the ability to change lives from here to here. At Simon's wake, the staff in the kitchen were weeping because they don't see me on TV anymore and they weren't hearing me on the radio. You never know who's listening and who's watching. So we need to speak to the highest potential inside everybody who gets to experience us and our work. For the control freak in me, that's my challenge. To float like a feather, and to be okay with the fact that I am so not in control. We aren't in control. That is the illusion that was completely blasted through this entire experience. The only thing we control is the space between stimulus and response. And that's where we have the power to choose what we do in the very next moment of our lives. Aeneas Nin says that life shrinks and expands in proportion to one's courage. Nikki Bush says, life shrinks and expands in proportion to one's courage and curiosity. I honor you, I honor me, I honor my husband, and I honor this moment. It's the only moment we have.